Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Martin with the All Night Channel. We are bringing you another book author, and probably no one has been written about more that has lived in Illinois than Abraham Lincoln, and we have yet another book. Uh, but this one examining a part of Lincoln's life that hasn't really had too much examination. And we are joined on the Illinois Channel by Professor Ron Keller from Lincoln, Illinois. And Ron, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. So you wrote the book, Lincoln in the Legislature. When did that come out and uh, what prompted you to write it? Well, Terry, I'm happy to be with you. Thank you for having me on. Uh, yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, Lincoln uh, is uh, a favorite topic for many people. We never seem to exhaust that topic. So uh, how this all started is SIU Press, Southern Illinois University Press, has a concise Lincoln Library series, which they decided to put out uh, several years ago because they found that many of their readers were looking for something more topical, right? Uh, just a snippet on Lincoln's marriage, Lincoln and race, Lincoln and his law career. So what they decided to do was section off many topics of Abraham Lincoln, find authors that would, uh, that would look at some of these particular topics. And so I've always been interested in Lincoln and politics. And so um, I was approached if I would write on Lincoln as an Illinois legislator, seeing that the last time a book was written on Lincoln as an Illinois legislator, as a focus of one, as a single focus, um, was Paul Simon back in 1965. Uh, the, so they felt that this particular topic needed a brushing up. And so that's what prompted this particular research in this particular book. Uh, when Lincoln was in the legislature, he was in what is now the old state capital, and that's here in Springfield. Uh, as part of your book, uh, tell us about what kind of research you did, and did you visit the old state capital just to kind of physically get a, a feel for what it was like for Lincoln to be sitting there and giving the speeches that he gave? Yeah, I think uh, anybody who writes any book on any topic needs to make the quote unquote holy pilgrimage, right? Uh, and they need to visit. Uh, and, and I tell my students all the time in my history classes that physical places are sometimes the best way to gain a true appreciation of history. So, I mean, I had to do to walk the walk, right? And so I did, I went down to visit, I'd seen Vandalia before, um, that had been several years, and I really didn't have an appreciation for Lincoln as a legislator. But when I began my research, which began in 2015, I went down to Vandalia, uh, and uh, I was able, through the generous um, courtesy of the um, state, uh, the historic site superintendent of Vandalia, to be able to sit in the chairs, to take my few moments to nerd out, uh, sit in uh, the area of the room, which would have been the area where Lincoln sat, um, near a desk that he would have not, not the original one. But, um, and so I sat there uh, and imagine what it's like. Um, I did the same thing, of course, at the old state capitol as well. And you get a real sense when you're there of the importance of those particular places. Uh, and so truly indeed, uh, Terry, it is something else to really, uh, to be there, you almost commune with Lincoln. You can almost hear him talk. You can almost see the other legislators in the room. And many of the things that I had begun to research about when I was at Vandalia um, became very real to me. And I think it really, uh, in my mind, it gave a true sense of the importance of Illinois and that period of time uh, in the 1830s uh, and early 1840s, as well as Lincoln's place as a legislator in that very crucial time in our Illinois history. Let me ask, when you, um, when you started the book and looked at it, you, or let me say this, so let me change the question. If, if someone is reading your book, um, what would they learn and what did you learn as an author? Because, you know, you're a history uh, professor. Uh, you ran the Lincoln Collection. The last time we did something together, you were giving us a tour of the Lincoln Collection at Lincoln College. Right. Uh, and, and by the way, I've never seen anyone uh, of an amateur, you might say, be so articulate on camera. I, you're, you're better than I am uh, as far as just talking off the top of your head. But uh, so you're not new to the topic of Lincoln. What, did, uh, what kind of things did you learn? What kind of things will the uh, reader learn that maybe they didn't uh, know about already? Well, 
So uh, the thing is about Lincoln is that there are so many aspects and periods of his life that we study, but Lincoln as a legislator, it's, it's not really fully appreciated. In fact, uh, the thing is, is Lincoln spent four terms as an Illinois legislator, but the years of the 1830s and, and 1840s are, uh, unfortunately, the uh, role of Lincoln as an Illinois legislator in most biographies of Lincoln are relegated as a side story. I mean, in the 1830s, he was a practicing lawyer. Uh, he was a man who was, uh, who was discovering what his, um, he was discovering courtships, right? His, his relationship with Ann Rutledge and Mary Owens and then Mary Todd. Uh, and so unfortunately, these years as a legislator are pretty much, again, relegated as a side story in his life. And I really felt that that can't be the case. Uh, this is his first political career. This is when he begins. This is the formation of Lincoln. This is the formation really in many ways of Illinois. And, and this is what I found in the research, and I can certainly talk about that more perhaps in a later question, is, is how he really in greater detail developed uh, into the person, into the politician that he became. But I, I, I was uh, appreciated better, and I want the reader to appreciate the fact that this is a formative period in his life. And uh, when, when Lincoln, when Paul Simon wrote this book, Sen late Senator Paul Simon wrote this book in 1965 on Lincoln as a legislator, um, I think that Paul Simon did a really, really great job of appreciating Lincoln. But I felt also it needed a new take. Uh, knowing that there's new research out there, knowing that there's a lot of uh, information online that probably wasn't at the disposal of Senator Simon, um, I felt that it needed a different look. And so I did not set out to rehash Senator Simon, and, and certainly we can get into this if you want, but I actually break in some cases with some of his uh, theories and, and theses that he comes across with. And so I felt that also Lincoln's character needed to be emphasized as well, because again, I think that the person and politician that he became, including his character, was really developed in those years in Vandalia and in Springfield. What were the uh, the main themes? Uh, what was, when Lincoln was a, a legislator, what was he focused on? And I don't know if this plays into it, but I'm gonna point out to people, one of the interesting things where you're located, Lincoln, Illinois, is that Lincoln, Illinois was named after Abraham Lincoln while Lincoln was still alive. I think it's the only community on the planet that was named for Lincoln while Lincoln was alive. So to what, what extent was Lincoln representing the railroads in the legislature? To what extent did he start to get into the question of the slavery issue? Or what was basically the, the meat and potatoes of his legislative career? Like any other elected official um, and politician, um, he develops. And I, and I think that we have to appreciate that. The Lincoln who first campaigned for the legislature in 1832, which he lost his first time around, and then the legislator and politician that Lincoln became in 1834 and 1836 and 1838 and 1840 was very much different than 1832. And I think we would expect that because the state also changed and developed. Lincoln really ran in 1832 on a platform of three main issues. One uh, was education. He believed that um, the agricultural area of central Illinois, uh, which was largely illiterate, um, needed to be a um, populace which was more educated. Uh, he also ran on uh, development of rivers. Um, New Salem, where he lived until 1837, uh, so he, where he spent the first half of his legislative career at home, was along the Sangamon River. And he believed that this particular town, if it ever would develop, had to develop because of river transportation. And so he believed river transportation was the future of, of the, the of the success really of the pioneer people and the frontier people of Illinois. Well, that would change because um, in, in his first address where he, he discusses his platform, he mentions railroads, but even in 1832, he felt railroads were too expensive. So he abandoned that, but he would pick that up in a few years. The third issue he first ran on was uh, lower interest rates. He felt that a lot of the frontier people, um, the part of the problem is that when they, um, when they were poor, as they were, and they needed um, loans, many of the banks would give them loans at high interest rates, um, excessive interest rates for the point that it kept them poor. So you wanted to keep what's called the usury rates 
low. Um, eventually, the railroad becomes a, 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 and canals become a fever pitch, not just for Lincoln, but the entire legislature of Illinois. And this is what I find to be fascinating, that Illinois and the legislature of Illinois wanted to become the great state of the country. New York had already developed the Erie Canal, and uh, even Lincoln was called the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois uh, because he had such a fascination uh, and an urge, a almost a fever pitch, right, to develop uh, Illinois as a state that had canals and bridges and railroads. So infrastructure was very, very huge. And I don't think he ever really fully abandoned that. Lincoln's belief was that people and needed to rise and government needed to have a role in helping people rise. And they could do that by providing a lot of support through infrastructure and those particular means. Um, so that's where he really, uh, lay, that's where he lays his hat. Eventually, uh, he also then uh, picks on the, uh, up the idea that perhaps the capital should be relocated, which we can certainly get into. And that's where he and the long nine really began to do a lot of political maneuvering. Yeah, we can only talk so, I mean, and we're going to skip over, obviously, a whole lot of details of sure. this would be a nine-hour conversation, but uh, sure. one of the things, as you were just mentioning, that Lincoln's responsible, I think, for at least two things off the top of my head that kind of made his legislative career, and I say in my ignorance, but uh, that one, he was instrumental in getting the state capital to move from Vandalia to Springfield, and then the other mm -hmm. thing is we mentioned you're in Lincoln, Illinois, named for him while he was alive because, as I understand it, he got the railroad to come to Lincoln, Illinois. So even right there, uh, while they may not be uh, monumental as in fighting the Civil War, uh, he, he left his mark in central Illinois by virtue of the fact that Springfield is the state capital and that Lincoln, Illinois has the railroad uh, coming there, which is one thing that uh, accounted for its development. Um, but what also, uh, let me ask you, uh, when you, knowing what you know about him as president, um, do we know, was he a, uh, going back to his legislative days, was he a fiscal conservative? Did Do you see the strands of what he thought in the state legislature carrying over uh, in his approach to issues that came before him in the White House. We tend to think of him as doing nothing but the Civil War, and that that certainly was the preponderance of it, but he, he obviously had to propose budgets and have other issues. Um, so uh, how do we see the the acorn, you might say, of the Lincoln that later went in to become the giant in the White House? Uh, that's, a, that's a large question, Terry. Uh, it really is. And so, um, there's so much that I could throw out there, but uh, to, to answer your question, um, when it comes to his ideology, uh, I certainly hesitate, you know, ascribing any sort of modern day uh, ideological descriptions to what Lincoln was, because I think it's difficult to transcend the, the periods of time and the issues. But um, he definitely did believe that the future success of the country lay in building the economy of the country. And that's where I go back to building the railroads, building infrastructure, uh, and things of this nature, and then canals and things, and even banks. Um, he believed that the loans, low interest rates, but the banks were very, very crucial uh, to the development of the state. Uh, and so, um, fiscally, again, it's he. It's very hard to put him on that on that scale. But as far as equipping him with some of the things that he would use to become president. Um, I see so much. One, again, is the development of character. He, he is a politician, uh, and uh, it, it's easy to think of Lincoln as this sort of all shucks kind of humble guy. I'll say I, I didn't really get that sense studying Lincoln as an Illinois legislator. Um, he was ambitious. He was a politician. It didn't take him long to learn the ropes of how to make backroom deals. I don't think anything shady but he learned how politics works, how legislation gets passed, how vote trading, aka log rolling, which is what they called it, works. And these are the certain skills that he had to learn as a politician and, and would utilize even later as president uh, and, and even in his one term in Congress in the 1840s. And so um, Lincoln was ambitious. 
Uh, and he, uh, he was someone who I don't feel necessarily stepped on other people's toes, but he really, and this is one of the things that I really found out that surprised me about Lincoln was how much he really grappled with becoming a successful politician and elected official, yet trying to keep his esteem in check. Um, when he first runs for office, he says, every man has said to have a peculiar ambition. Um, and mine is to win the esteem of my fellow man. Uh, and uh, he, how, what links he would go to win that esteem? I think he did some things. Um, he he um, made fun of people, he ridiculed people, he used the newspaper in the 1830s to mark uh, his, his opponents. Things that he eventually would grow and develop and, um, and learn not to do um, later on. Um, but I guess I would say the, the biggest thing that I think he takes from his legislative years, other than the experience of how to be elected official and politician, is the relationships. Uh, Lincoln never loses many of the relationships that he develops in the 1830s. I mean, keep in mind, he meets for the first time Stephen Douglas in the legislature, Orville Browning, uh, William Fithian, um, uh, Jesse Du Bois, uh, Usher Linder. Uh, these are all names of people that would come into play when he runs for Senate in 1858, for president in 1860, uh, and would be people that would often visit him in the White House when he was president. As a writer, you you take on a project and you have some parts that uh, you know, and then you start doing the research to find out what you don't know. And uh, Do you develop a you know, you're probably like everyone, before you took this book on, I mean, we tend to think of Lincoln as the bust in the on Mount Rushmore and all, you know, this iconic person. But to what extent when you started doing the research, uh, did you find that he started to become real to you and, and where you almost developed a relationship as if you kind of got into his mind and you kind of felt differently than you did before you started the project? Um, Talk about that, because uh, very few of us are going to take the time to write a book, or and I'm sure it took you some time to, to work on this. So when you're grappling with that person for some time, what is that process like? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, you, you learn to, uh, to either fall in love with character um, or hate the character. Um, or a third option, which I think is what I, what I, I found, was that you begin to see the flaws but you also learn to understand that we all have flaws. Um, I, I quipped a few years ago to my wife when I first started this whole Abraham Lincoln scholarship, writing, reading, directing the museum. Uh, she mentioned to me one day, uh, you, I think you love Abraham Lincoln more than I do. And I said, no, I just love him differently. Uh, so whatever that is supposed to mean. But you begin to uh, learn and appreciate Abraham Lincoln and you begin to appreciate him for who he was as a person. Uh, and indeed, as I was saying earlier, uh, one of the things that definitely surprised me in my research on Abraham Lincoln was, uh, again, how ambitious of a politician he was. Should that have surprised me? No, but I think it did because, again, we are sold this image of Lincoln um, as someone who was this humble rail splitter. Uh, and he was humble uh, in the sense that he didn't feel it was all about him. But... Um, Nobody gets to be Whig floor leader for three terms in a row as he was uh, and vie for speaker of the House of Representatives for the Illinois legislature without having some political ambition and probably ste without stepping on a few toes. Um, and, and that he did. And so I think I, I, I grew to appreciate him for who he was. Um, was I a, a little bit embarrassed for him when he would um, attack his opponents in newspaper anonymously? Yes, I was. But then again, I understand we all have to make these mistakes because if he didn't, I don't think he would have become the president that he was, the eloquent president that he was, the uh, president without an agenda that he was, the president who's able to become the intellectual policymaker that he was, again, without laying the groundwork as the legislator in Illinois. So this was his training grounds, it was his proving ground. And I think he did that very successfully. I think all of these books help to add it. It's, uh, it's Lincoln has a mosaic of his life and there's so many books on Lincoln, but they're all like a big puzzle piece where you, you fit the pieces together. And, you know, many, many of these books are taking 
as, as this does, Lincoln and the legislature, taking one aspect of the person's life and then going deep into that, whether some of the other books are more uh, broad. Uh, but let's talk just uh, before we conclude, uh, tell us a bit about your, your teaching at Lincoln College there in Lincoln. Um, what, what do you teach uh, to what, uh, in general? And, and what do you think about, the, as far as your students, what kind of thing these days are they interested in? And I say that with this in mind, that I, I sometimes worry, is the next generation picking up the themes of American government? When, when we go and cover any number of things, whether uh, at the Union League Club of Chicago or the Lincoln Presidential Library Museum and these great speakers that come, Doug Brinkley was just here talking about his book on the space program. Uh, but so many times it seems like the youngest people in the room are like 60 years old. And I, I just question to myself, is, is history and, and the love of American government is something that evolves over time or is the younger generation uh, being, are we in danger of having a generation raised where they're disconnected from why we have the three branches of government, why we have the Bill of Rights and how America came to be the form of American government that we have? Yeah, Terry, um, I, I do. Uh, well, first of all, to your first question, I, I teach uh, history, uh, American history, largely uh, a Lincoln course, African American history and American government. Um, and, and certainly, I, I think that um, I am continually alarmed sometimes of what our students don't know uh, that I felt that they probably should have picked up through through high school education or through uh, at least talking with their parents or understanding that, you know, what happens by reading the news or something, a better, deeper understanding uh, of our history. But then, and when I don't get it, I sometimes have to take a deep breath and think, okay, uh, I was probably, I was very young and dumb when I was 18, 19 years of, of age as a college student. And I have to understand that that's okay. Uh, I, I probably knew very little. I probably knew less than what I remember that I knew. Uh, and my job is to sort of inculcate into students, I think, a love for history and appreciation for history. Um, but one thing I try to also do is to um, merge character because I think great people in history are great because of the character and the legacy that they leave. Uh, and that's one of the things that is so crucial about Abraham Lincoln because I think we miss the story if we don't understand that character still matters. Uh, how you treat people still matters. Um, your honesty still matters and things of this nature. So if nothing else, if they don't know every question uh, on my test and remember every date, remember every battle, if they can remember and take from those experiences of history lessons, which they can um, foster, I think that is history well done and well learned and well received. Well, Ron Keller, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Obviously, we could go on and on. There's so many different aspects, but people can know there is a new publication. And let me just ask before we close out, where uh, if people want to get your book, where can they find it? Uh, thank you, uh, Terry. So it is, first of all, um, available through the uh, Southern Illinois University Press website. Uh, their Concise Lincoln Library series. So look up SIU Press Concise Lincoln Library. Uh, it can be found on Amazon.com. Um, I know that uh, most sellers, especially in Springfield and Lincoln, who sell Lincoln books, the Presidential Library Museum uh, and our museum in Lincoln, Lincoln Heritage Museum, I'll sell it. So uh, if any of your stores shop uh, stock Lincoln books, they probably, hopefully, have this particular book. So uh, I appreciate that and feel free to buy six or 17 copies. Uh, do you plan to be going ar around uh, at this time or and giving any lectures or are you open to being invited to go to speak to some groups and talk about your book? Yes, um, I don't. Uh, I am. Uh, I have several on the docket, though I don't think anything can top an interview with you. But uh, I certainly do have several that I'm planning to do. And as I'm also waiting for someone to call me and say they want the movie rights. Um, so uh, Steven Spielberg hopefully will check out the book. I say that in kidding, but uh, nonetheless, I do hope that if nothing else, people gain an appreciation for Lincoln in his early years and how important it was to both Illinois and to him. 
Ron Keller, we appreciate again you taking the time to talk with us. Good luck on the book and uh, thank you for educating another generation of uh, students on how many fascinating stories there really are. You know, not, not just for these are going to be the next generation of lawmakers and congressmen and our leaders, but just there's so many fascinating stories in American history. It, it's a shame that people uh, come late to the table, so to speak. But thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it.